Senator from Oklahoma. I'd like unanimous consent to be able to use a prop during this speech. Without objection. In about an hour, this body will gather. There'll be 100 senators here to make a decision about what we're going to do to take a step on border security. It's an issue that's bedeviled, quite frankly, this body for decades. It's been three decades since we've passed anything to the law to be able to change border security. In the meantime, administration after administration has pieced together the broken pieces of law in the disjointed pieces and tried to make regulatory actions to see what they can do to be able to change the direction of the country. We've seen it just over the last 10 or 15 years, what's really happened with that. I mean, this is just an encounter number from CBP, and we can look back to 2009, and we can see the numbers stayed about half a million or so for multiple years. This is through the Obama administration as they struggled, because the numbers were lower than this even before, as they struggled with a half a million numbers. And then we see during the Trump administration how the num numbers bump up and jump up here all the way almost to a million in a single year. It's twice as many as it was during the Obama time period. And then we see the COVID time period, it dives back down. And then right there is the transition in President Biden's time. And the numbers have skyrocketed. They doubled from the Obama administration to this year in the Trump administration, but then they've tripled even from the highest year of the Trump administration during the, during the Biden administration. And it wasn't a single bump year like it was under the Trump administration. It's been year after year after year. And by the way, this little one, that's this fiscal year. That's just since October, which by the way, you'll notice in the last four months is higher than any year under the Obama administration and almost as high as the peak year under the Trump administration. And that's four months so far this year. Americans feel it. We feel it in our cities. We feel it in our schools and our communities. We see the television and we see all of the chaos on our southern border. Cities around the country have said, do something. Make this stop. Americans, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent, are all unanimous on this issue this is a problem that needs to be solved. Do what you can. Today, we get to decide if we're going to do that or not. If we're going to do nothing or do something. The bill that's been put together has been a bipartisan effort. Welcome to the United States Senate. That's what we have to do. While I have people from around the country and back home that say, do a Republican-only bill, just get all of our priorities and none of them, none of theirs, I smile at them and say, welcome to governance. You can do a partisan bill in the House, but in the Senate, we have to look at each other across the aisle and then figure out a way to be able to solve this. Sometimes it's in committees, sometimes it's a gathering, sometimes it was like this time get members together, Republican, Independent, Democrat, to be able to sit down and hash out the issues. To say this is a problem, we all agree. We're not gonna agree on the solutions necessarily, but we all agree this is a problem, but we have to figure out what the solutions might be. That's been the process for the last four months. Four months to sit down and hash through the very difficult, very technical issues of border security in our nation with one goal, Let's make progress. We understood from the beginning we're not going to solve everything. We're not. We knew from the beginning it's not going to be perfect. But we also knew the status quo is untenable. We have to do something to be able to make the status quo better. So that's what we work towards, to be able to change where we are now. The product we put out this past weekend allowed everybody to see it. Quite frankly, I had some of my colleagues that said, I'll need weeks to evaluate it because it's so technical, and it is. But some of them literally within minutes said, no, I don't agree. Fine. But after time to be able to review it, the National Border Patrol Council, the group that's actually on the ground trying to manage the chaos, they read through the bill and evaluated it. And the National Border Patrol Council gave this statement. The Border Patrol Act of 2024 will give the United States Border Patrol agents authorities codified in law 
that we have not had in the past. While not perfect, and I'll agree with him on that, the Border Patrol Act of 2024 is a step in the right direction and it is far better than the current status quo. This is why the National Border Patrol Council endorses this bill and hopes for its quick passage. I understand this. In this building and in the 202 area code that is Washington, D.C., border security is a political issue. But if we leave the 202 area code everywhere else in the country, this is not a political issue, it's a national security issue. And when you actually go to the Border Patrol Council, those that see the chaos day to day, they're saying, send us some help, send us anything. Because quite frankly, Americans are frustrated and angry because our borders are open. They've seen the record numbers in the last four months. They know full well what's happening. The 60 Minutes story from this last weekend about Chinese nationals using TikTok to be able to find the holes in the fence and to be able to navigate it, how to be able to connect with Mexican cartel members to be able to navigate them through Mexico to be able to get through. Why is that such a big story? Because we used to rarely have Chinese nationals come across our border. But yet, last year, we had 37,000 Chinese nationals come across our border. 37,000. Americans watched the story of a group of migrants in New York City ruthlessly beating up a police officer this past week, and then seeing they were released again. They're angry. They're frustrated. The stories that have come out in the news recently of three child sex traffickers who had attempted re-entry back into the United States make Americans go, hold on. And just a few days ago, the story coming out of an Al-Shabaab terrorist on our terror watch list that had, been, that had come across our border and been released just early last year that they then picked them up while they were in Minnesota just a few weeks ago. We've had 50 people that have been identified on the terror watch list that we did apprehend in just the last four months. We've had tens of thousands of people in the last year that were identified by this administration as individuals, what they call special interest aliens. By definition, they're a national security risk. Tens of thousands that we didn't know their name in particular, but we know where they live is in an area of high national security risk because a high terrorism rate is in the, coming from that area. So we have no criminal history on them to be able to identify them on our terror watch list, but we know there's a high chance they're a national security risk. Those individuals were released into the country. Americans feel it. They want something different. The Americans that I talk to and the Oklahomans that I talk to don't mind legal immigration. In fact, they celebrate legal immigration. They just don't want illegal immigration. They want an orderly process. They want to know that the rule of law still matters in America. That's what they want to know. They want to know their American way of life is protected, and that should not be too much to demand. This very divided nation brings to us a very divided Congress. Currently, we have a Republican two-vote majority in the House of Representatives and a Democrat one-vote majority in the United States Senate. It doesn't get much closer than that to being equally divided in two bodies. But that means if we're gonna solve something, we have to sit down together and solve it. That's how it works when you make law. You can do press conferences without the other side, but you can't make law without the other side in the United States Senate. So we have to sit down and work things out. In October, when Israel was ruthlessly attacked with a terrorist attack by Hamas, the President of the United States came to Congress and said, we need additional funding to help Israel, to help Ukraine, to help with the threats in Taiwan and additional money for our southern border. Republicans responded by saying, we are not going to help give money to the southern border, by the way, especially for some of the funding that they asked for on the southern border, like safe migration offices to be able to 
help facilitate greater traffic to the United States. We said, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give additional money to the southern border unless we get a change in law and policy. And it's not a radical concept, quite frankly. The House of Representatives last, last, last year passed a very comprehensive bill on border security that they call H.R. 2. It was one of their priorities. You know why? Because the House of Representatives at that time said we need a change in law. So they brought a bill to change the law for that. We said the same thing, we need a change in law because it's significant what has occurred and we need to address it. The frightening thing is, since we started meeting in a bipartisan way in October, October was the highest number of illegal crossings in any October in our history. November was the highest number of illegal crossings of any November in our history. December was the highest number of illegal crossings of any December in our history and the highest single month in history of illegal crossings, including having the highest single day ever in the history of our country in illegal crossings, over 12,000 in a single day. That's what's happened just since we've been negotiating this bill, trying to be able to get to a solution. The problem has not gotten better. It's gotten worse during that time period. We need to solve this. Worst case scenario is status quo. We need to solve it. So we came up with a bill. It doesn't have everything in it I wanted. It doesn't have everything in it my Democratic colleagues wanted. But it definitely makes a difference. What's in this bill? Well, here's what the bill includes. Let me just walk through some of the high points of it. It includes more border wall construction. Under the 18-foot, 30-foot bollard style definition, in locations actually that were set by President Trump in those locations to actually build a wall. It has 50,000 detention beds, so it ends our catch and release issue. So especially single adults as they're coming across, the vast majority end up being held while they're being screened there rather than just released in the country as they are now. We doubled the deportation flights. We added money for DNA testing. We added money for additional state, local, and tribal law enforcement that we're partnering with along the border to be able to help with enforcement process there. We have a tremendous increase in the number of ICE agents, the number of Border Patrol agents, more asylum officers, more immigration judges. We added detection equipment at our ports of entry to interdict fentanyl, one of the biggest threats to our nation right now. And we increased the sanction authority for the United States government to be able to sanction those ruthless cartels and members of cartels and those that facilitate them to be able to go after the fentanyl issue in the United States. It has a pretty radical change in asylum law in it. It strengthens significantly the standard of evidence for declaring asylum. Today, people that are crossing the border can literally cross and say, I have fear in my country. When they say those magic words, they're released into the country, the vast majority of them, for up to 10 years while they await their screening or hearing. That would end under this bill. We increase significantly the standard for evidence. We had three new eligibility bars at the beginning of it, so we get to a faster screening process, and for those that are not eligible, a faster deportation. It is somewhat a Where's Waldo game on a day-to-day -day basis on our southern border. As we have thousands of people coming through us, some of those individuals do qualify for asylum, but most of them do not. So our goal was to be able to filter through quickly, identify those who qualify, and deport all of them that do not. We have a faster structure to process aliens when they cross the border, in detention or non-detained, either one, so they don't end up in the 10-year backlog awaiting their decision. Both for those who qualify for asylum don't wait 10 years, and those that everyone knows from the beginning they don't qualify for asylum, they're turned around and deported immediately. This ends the abuse of parole that's happening on our southern border today. Today, the administration will identify 1,500 people, will give them parole authority at one of our ports of entry and a work permit the first day they come. They don't have to qualify for asylum. They don't even have to apply for asylum. It is literally an open invitation from anyone anywhere in the world to get a work permit if you'll just tell us in advance you're coming. It's not lawful. It's just happening. This bill would end that. This bill also has a short-term, three-year authority to quickly stop the flow of people coming into our country right now. I had a lot of my colleagues on the Republican side that said, whatever we pass, 
will never be implemented by the Biden administration. We've got to do something, though, right now to be able to get things to change. Because everyone knows this is occurring not because of some migration trends around the world, but because right there, President Biden announced, I'm not going to build any more wall, and he dropped all the authorities that had been used, not just by President Trump, but by President Trump and Obama, dropped them, and we saw the skyrocket. So everyone said, whatever we pass, President Biden will never use. So whatever you can put in there to be able to actually make sure this occurs, please do. So we did. We included a border emergency authority that said, if we ever exceed 5,000 people, which by the way, is every day but seven in the last four months. If we ever exceed 5,000 people and we're in chaos level, the border shuts down completely. It's not optional, it's mandatory. And when I say shut down, it's pretty simple. What happens in the first 5,000? Let me make it clear. For the first 5,000 people that are coming across, they're detained, they're screened, and then deported. If you get above 5,000, we're in such a chaotic moment, we don't have time, so we just detain and deport them. There's no screening at all, because we've run out of time. We don't have the manpower to do it. That's the shift that occurs. It's not that the first 5,000 are released, that's ridiculous. The first 5,000 we detain, we screen, and then we deport. The second, if we get above 5,000, we just detain and deport. And when the borders close down, it's closed down for weeks, where we're not even screening for weeks until we get caught up. It was something that we could implement right now and to be able to make a difference. We also changed the funding process on this. There are items that the president really wanted on some of the funding. So we said, we're fine on that funding as long as you don't get that funding until you actually get more detention beds, get more deportation flights, hire more ICE officers, hire more Border Patrol, and actually implement the new policy. When you do that, then you get all the money that you're actually looking for on in the other areas. We wanted to make sure that actually this was going to be implemented. So we included that in the bill today. That's what we have on the floor today. And I'm afraid what I've heard some people say, it's not enough. So we'll make a decision soon. Let me just say this. I've listened to a lot of my colleagues in the last several days, as well I should, and I've listened for months. Some people legitimately want more time to read the bill. I have to tell you, it's 370 pages, it's incredibly technical, and I've had several colleagues said, I've started reading it and it makes my head hurt to read it because immigration law is very complicated. So they're going through it and they've said, hey, I'm interested in supporting this, I just need more time. Some of those folks are gonna, folks are gonna vote no today because they legitimately just need more time. I completely understand that. There are some folks that are voting no today because they have policy differences on the bill. We have asylum officers that are empowered to make decisions. They want immigration judges to make it. Okay, well, that's a, that's a policy difference on it. Some folks don't like that we have visas that are in this. That increases legal immigration, not illegal, legal immigration in the country. There are some folks that don't want any immigration of any type. Well, fine, we can have that policy difference. I don't mind legal immigration. I just don't, mind, I just don't want illegal immigration. Some of them may have policy differences. Some of them have been very clear with me. They have political differences with the bill. They say it's the wrong time to solve the problem or let the presidential election solve this problem. In fact, I had a popular commentator four weeks ago that I talked to that told me flat out before they knew any of the contents of the bill any of the content, none, nothing was out at that point, that told me flat out, if you try to move a bill that solves the border crisis during this presidential year, I will do whatever I can to destroy you. Because I do not want you to solve this during the presidential election. By the way, they have been faithful to their promise and have done everything they can to destroy me in the past several weeks. There are other folks that read the Facebook posts and the Twitter posts 
and saw different facts that they thought might be true. But I personally told them over and over again, they're false. And it's been hard to overcome. For some reason, we still believe everything we read on the internet. And it's been hard to be able to break through. A few weeks ago, I posted one of my favorite quotes from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who's a preacher from England in the 1850s, where he once said, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its boots on. And it couldn't have proved to be more true in this. I've seen posts like, there's amnesty in this, po in this bill. So that people adamantly oppose that there's amnesty in the bill. I would say some of my Democratic colleagues wanted to have some amnesty in this bill, but there wasn't. And there's not anything on amnesty in this bill. I've heard folks say it weakens our asylum laws when it actually does the opposite. It far strengthens our asylum laws so we can get to actual asylees faster and those that are gaming the system are turned around. I've heard folks say it takes away the Remain in Mexico policy so it can never come back. It does nothing of, of that at all. Nothing of that. I've had folks say it gives away work permits the very first day, which will incentivize more people to come when it actually does exactly the opposite. It actually removes the 1,500 work permits that are passed out every day and says we're not going to do that. And my favorite one has been it lets 5,000 aliens in every single day from here on out forever. And I've just said that's completely absurd. Why would anyone, anyone, sign a bill, approve a bill, or present a bill that locks us into this chaos. That's what we have now. The 5,000 piece was very simple. If we get to 5,000 a day, we can't process that many people anymore. It's a critical emergency. We break glass and say, we're not even gonna try to do hearings anymore. Everybody's gotta turn around, everything's shut down, so we can make sure that we can actually legally process people. We are detaining, screening, and deporting until we get to a break glass moment, and then we're not even screening anymore. We're just detaining and deporting because we can't manage the numbers. But that's not what's been told. What's been told has been false day after day. And then as I've mentioned, I've had a few folks that have said, if I can't get everything, I want nothing. I don't find most Americans are that way, just in their day-to-day -day life. We have high goals and aspirations as Americans, and quite frankly, I don't blame Americans for being really angry and frustrated where we are at the border, really angry and frustrated. But what I hear from most Oklahomans is, do something. Don't just sit there, do something. Make progress, but don't allow this to keep going. Stop it where you can. So that's what we work to do. Now, to be clear, President Biden has authorities he could have used that he's chosen not to. Authorities that President Trump used, authorities that President Obama used. That President Biden has chosen not to use. There's a lot of them. And for whatever reason, he has turned his head away from the chaos that America is focused on, and he needs to do what he can to solve this problem. But we also need to make changes in law. Our asylum law is weak. Everyone knows it. In fact, when President Trump was president, he even made the statements about how weak our laws are on asylum. When President Trump was president, he said, we do a very good job considering the laws are so bad. They're not archaic, they're incompetent. It's not that they're old, they're just bad. Well, guess what this bill does? Fixes that. Because the laws have a gap. And we should actually fix those things. What we cannot, what the president cannot do is change the asylum laws. He cannot change the faster deportations for people crossing. He cannot add an emergency authority like this. He cannot conduct faster hearings with limited appeals so we can get to deporting people that are not legal here and addressing those that are. Can't do that without a change in law. So we need to change the law. Madam President, I'm gonna vote yes to be able to move on to this bill. So we need a change in law. I understand we have differences, but we've got to 
sit down together, figure out how we're gonna solve problems because the American people sent us here to do that. This is the pen that I was handed at that desk when I was sworn in to the United States Senate. And I signed a book that was at that desk with this pen because I was becoming a United States Senator. Because the people at home sent me here to get stuff done and to solve problems. There's no reason for me to have this pen if we're just gonna do press conferences. I can do press conferences from anywhere, but we can only make law from this room and to do that, you need one of these pens. And there's a hundred of them in this room, and 60 of us have to agree to solve a problem. And I'm determined to sit down with anyone who wants to solve the problem, regardless of what side of the aisle that they're on, to figure out how we solve these things. Because Americans are ticked off that this is not resolved and they expect us to get things done. So why don't we do that? Madam President, I have two staff members named Sarah Seitz and Jacob Stubbs who worked their tail off for four months. They gave up Thanksgiving, they gave up Christmas, they gave up New Year's to work on this. The remarkable leaders but it's not just about the time they gave up and the wisdom that they have as leaders. Their focus on that was to solve a problem that at the end of this day may still be a problem unsolved. And tomorrow we'll probably have 6,500 people illegally cross our border just like is what's happening right now today, 6,500 people. Americans want that stopped. So let's actually sit down and figure out how we're going to stop it together. That I yield the floor.